thank you very much for being everybody. My name is Sean, I'm a public speaker, author and activist out of London. I'm going to talk about the lessons I learned and my jail experience. Can you imagine what it is like to be facing a 200 year sentence? After I graduated from university, I moved to Arizona with the goal of becoming a millionaire in the stock market. <laughs> I never imagined through my own bad choices, I would go so far beyond laws, I would end up in America's deadliest jail. Started getting interested in the stock market at a young age, 14. My economics teacher gave me lessons on my own, showed me how the stock markets, what they meant, the numbers in the Financial Times. At 16, I borrowed 50 pounds off my nan, doubled it in BT shares. Telling all my mates in my little town, I'm going to go to America, make a million, fly you guys over. That was my dream. So after, <laughs> so after, after graduating, I got work as a stockbroker in Arizona. In the beginning, I wasn't making much money. But five years in, I was the top guy in the office, grossing half a million a year, got my own staff, secretary, cold callers. But I had more money than common sense. The money went to my head. I started to throw rave parties with it. <laughs> and I, this is where I started to go beyond laws now. <laughs> I had people importing ecstasy from Holland. They were smuggling it in for me and I was distributing it. So I take full responsibility for what happened on May 16th, 2002, there was a knock on my door. Bang, 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 bang. I jump up from the computer, look out the peephole, it's blacked out. Go over to the window. Mark's men, police swap vehicles, whole apartment complex is surrounded. I can, all right, I better let them in. <laughs> I get halfway to the door, boom, the door just flies off the hinges. Hands above your heads, get on the ground, don't move. It wasn't my brightest idea to be breaking the law where not only were the gang members murdering the prisoners, even the guards were murdering the prisoners. I had to get used to the sounds of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around, people getting carried on the stretchers who looked like they were dead. Phoenix is the hottest of the big cities in America. It gets up to almost 50 degrees hot all year round. Way too hot to be wearing our black and white striped outfits. So everyone's just going around the underwear, which are pink boxers. <laughs> That's to humiliate the prisoner. Even so, trying to stay cool in your, in your boxers. It's like a concrete oven in there. It's like we're being cooked alive and the building stays warm all night long. And it wreaks havoc with your skin. You start to get these skin infections and bed sores that itch and bleed, especially on your behind because you sat around all day. One of the hardest parts for me was just lying in this pool of sweat at night and the itchiness keeping me awake. When you're sweating constantly, the outer layers of your skin start to turn soggy. So you get the itchiness, and when you scratch yourself, clumps of your own skin detach under your nails. Yeah. I remember one night I, I fell asleep on my side. I didn't realize it, but my ear had filled up with sweat. And when I changed position, the sweat just ran all over my face. It was like someone was touching me. It just freaked me out and woke me up. Yeah. So we got two meals a day. Breakfast came in a plastic bag. Moldy bread and green bologna. Green bologna, it's a raw sausage meat. Gone past its sell-by date. It's got a green shine to it. A lot of the food was in boxes businesses were throwing away because it had expired. The mold on the bread, blue, green. Sometimes our mold came in these fantastic psychedelic colors that looked like works of art. <laughs> and we were so hungry, we would scratch the mold off the bread. And because the bread was stale, we'd put it in water and swill it to get it down. Evening meal was a mystery meat slop we called Red Death. It looked like carroty vomit blended with blood. Had all kinds of random meat in it, and it stunk. Occasionally, there was a dead rat in it. One time, we gave a rat back to the guards. We complained, and they came back later in the day, and so the jail won't get any trouble. 
they said it was just a potato. <laughs> and there wasn't much we could do. Boss of the jail, one of his favorite quotes, cost us more to feed our police dogs than our prisoners. And our police dogs are working for a living. So my parents remortgaged the house, pumped with almost $100,000 to get a lawyer. I said, Sean, look, we can get you out of the jail. Go court, have a bail hearing, get your bail reduced. I'm getting all excited. Yeah, finally I'm getting out of the jail. Girlfriend's excited. All my local family shop in court. Uncle, ex-police officer, speaks on my, on my behalf. It seems to have gone really well. Except, the prosecutor's trying to make her name off my case. She sabotages the hearing. The judge doubles my bail to 1.5 million cash only. Once your bail goes over a million, you're automatically reclassified from medium security over to maximum security. So it's about two in the morning when I walk into my cell. It's dark inside, but there's some light coming in from the day room. First thing I notice, two-man cell. That's an improvement, but I'm wondering why my cellmate is asleep on the top bunk, because where I come from, people fight over the bottom bunk. So I think something's not quite right. So I walk in some more. I start to sense movement on the walls and the ceiling. I think my eyes are playing tricks. So I put my face right up to the wall to see what's going on. And it's covered in these guys. I got used to the violence by now. Trying to get sleep with these crawling me gave me nervous breakdown. I had to get put on medication. Eight at night is lockdown. Ten is lights out. They know when the lights are about to go out. They start lining up in the cracks in the walls in this old building, doing this little movement with the antennae sticking out, like an army waiting to invade. As soon as the lights go out, they just flood the room. Now you've got a choice. You wrap a sheet around you, so you look like the mummy, leave a breathing hole. It does keep them off you, but the sheet traps the heat to your body. And like I mentioned earlier, you've got all these bleeding and itching skin infections and bed sores. The trapped heat makes it so unbearably itchy you can't possibly sleep. So you end up just throwing the sheet off and letting them crawl on you. Fortunately, they don't bite. They start out tickling your feet, limbs, palms of your hands. To this day, if anyone tickles my hands, I, I flinch because I, I woke up so many nights with them tickling my hands. They try to get in your ears to eat your earwax. It's like honey to them. Is anyone in here asthmatic? Anyone with asthma? Okay, well check this story out. I had a neighbor, <laughs> had a neighbor in maximum security who's asthmatic, wakes up one morning, out of breath, grabs his inhaler, takes a blast, psh, shoots a live cockroach inside himself. Starts, starts freaking out, saying he can feel it moving around inside him. <laughs> Throws up, and his stomach contents come out, but somehow the insect is stuck inside him, it won't come out. Even in the daytime, there were so many, the prisoners were doing cockroach races, gambling on the winner. And first thing in the, in the morning, the, the fellows would come out their cells with plastic containers, they'd put peanut butter in to trap them, and they'd empty all the dead ones into the, into the trash can of the stirs. It didn't matter how many we killed, they owned the building. Now, in my first year, I was resenting getting caught. I was pining for my old lifestyle back. I was still attached to material things. But in the second year, the prosecutor said, Every time you spoke about drugs on the phone, carries five to ten years. You've got 20 plus charges. If you go to trial and lose, we're going to stack all those charges up to a maximum 200 year sentence. The prospect of getting a 200 year sentence pushed me to the brink of suicidal insanity. I, I couldn't sleep with the cockroaches crawling on me. I've seen um, imaginary insects and hearing voices. Um, I had all these infections and, and bed sores. I had a pink eye infection, yellow pus was coming out my eyeball. I'm thinking, I can't take this anymore. I'm just going to slash my wrists and bleed out. But I'm going to do it after a guard does a security walk. Now, before I was going to do it, I wanted to say goodbye to my family and friends. And what I mean by that is I was allowed seven photos in the jail. So I get the photos out of my mom, dad, girlfriend. I'm looking through them and I'm 
you start getting really, really sad. You know, thinking my mum's going to get a call saying her son's killed himself in a foreign jail. And I just couldn't bear the thought of that. I just got really sad, started crying, and that's what actually saved my life. But when you're facing 200 years, I actually credit that now with crushing that material side out of me because getting sentenced to nine and a half years was one of the happiest days of my life. I could see when I was going to get my life back. When you're facing 200 years, your million dollar house and your swimming pool on the, ma on the mountain don't matter. Your sports car is irrelevant. Plasma screen, TV, all your gadgets, who cares? The other thing it taught me, that my second lesson was about helping others. Before facing 200 years, my, you know, my behavior was selfish, narcissistic, hedonistic, getting high, getting my party friends high. But there came a turning point in the jail. About a third of the prisoners couldn't read or write. I started to read their legal paperwork and explain what was going on to them. Some of the Mexican prisoners couldn't write home in Spanish, so I started to help them write home in Spanish to their loved ones. And the other thing, um, after that, I, I got moved over to the state prison system then, once I got out of the Ruman jail. And the guards put me in with this guy on the left. He's a serial home invader, torturer. He was breaking into people's houses and taking hammers to their kneecaps. His welcoming statement to me, I've got a padlock in a sock, I can smash your brains in while you sleep, I can kill you whenever I want. Really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> He knew my family was flying over to visit me for Christmas, so he got his mate, this guy on the right, this 20 stone California biker, to attack me just when my parents had flown over to visit me. It didn't, it didn't end up very well for me at all, let's, let's put it that way. I got smashed. I got moved out of that cell, and my new cellmate introduced me to a guy he thought could protect me. His name was Two Tonys. <laughs> he was a mafia mass murderer serving 141 years. It left the dead bodies of rival gangsters from Arizona to Alaska. Now, because he'd only murdered rival gangsters, he was at the top of the respect in the prison. So once he took me under his wing, I never got smashed again. He was looking for someone to write his life story. He called me his official biographer. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, going, I was sneaking in his cell every day, and the people who came in to pay respect to him, that respect started to rub off on me. Now, Tony's was a big reader. He introduced me to John Updike, Norman Mailer, Tom Wolfe. He comes into my cell one day with a book, one of his favorites. He says, Sean, you've got to read this. It was A Day in the Life of Ivan Donosevich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So Ivan's in the Russian gulag under the Stalin era. They're working these guys to death in the freezing cold. If you refuse to work, you're dragged to death by horseback or you're thrown off a cliff. So. Whenever the prisoners complained about anything, where we was at, two Tonys would laugh at them and say, hey, this is how bad Ivan had it. For example, if the prisoners complained about the breakfast being cold in the morning, two Tonys would say, where Ivan was at, they were fighting over a fish eyeball in the soup. So two Tonys learned me to appreciate the small things. Now, I also, my guardian angel in there was a therapist called Dr. O, and he knew I was on this reading program. When I was facing 200 years, I pledged to read as many books as possible, and I managed to read over a thousand books in just under six years. I read a lot of the original texts in philosophy and psychology, and they helped me go deep inside myself and address the root causes of why I got involved in drugs and crime. So the therapist said, that's well and good you're reading this stuff, but how can you apply this to your life? Come up with some quotes from these books and bring them to me and we'll discuss them. So I'd like to share three of those with you. First one is Nietzsche. Live your life like a work of art. Look at how much effort people put into a work of art. If you put that much effort into your life, how much the quality of your life would improve. Another one is Marcus Aurelius. And this applies, it's helpful for prisoners because they're in chaotic situations, but we all go through rough things on the road of life. You know, loss of a loved one, end up in a relationship breakup, you think you're, not, you're never gonna get anyone to love you again, lose your job, think you can't, you're never going to be able to pay your bills, stuff like that. But with Marcus Aurelius, the quote is, that chaos, he compared it to the ocean with the waves lashing against the promenade. And you're like the promenade remaining strong when those waves are crashing down, maintaining equanimity. The third one is Epictetus. We're, we're disturbed not by things, but by the views that we take of them. I'll give you an example of this. In prison, people are calling each other names all day long. 
and the people who get picked on the most are the ones who react the most. But according to Epictetus, we can choose our reaction. It doesn't matter what people say, we can choose it through our thoughts. So from facing 200 years and from two Tonys, I appreciate the small things now. Two Tonys died from liver cancer from his own drug taking in 2010. But in a sense, the spirit of him lives on in me. I wake up with a smile on my face now. There's no dead rats in my food anymore. There's no cockroaches in my bed. I'm free, I'm in the West, where things are you know, so good, when there's all this horrible stuff going on around the world. And I, I, my biggest lesson was to learn that happiness is in your heart and your, what your thoughts make it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thank you, thank you. Thank you.